farmer's daughter. Take one. My wife is not well. It happens after dark. Ma'am? Something's wrong. You don't want to leave, do you? I just don't understand why you're doing all this. Because it is possible to make a good, dirty movie. It is what it is. We record this in the real world. On from broadcasting from stolen land, there were so many. Um, well, I'm sure the same out in your area, but there were so many uh, tribes of native people here first that there's a lot of conflicting uh, answers when I try to see whose land I am actually on, whose stolen land. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure. Like, I mean, because we have a lot of reservation land, so I assume like they probably didn't move these people too far from where they already were. But also, they kind of gave them like the shittiest fucking land imaginable. They're like, here you go. You're gonna freeze to death the winter up here. So, I don't know. I'd be interested to find out though. I'm sure there was probably like. I don't know, because there's lots of stuff to eat around here if you're like a, you know, native tribe 100, 200 years ago or whatever. But yeah, the winters are fucking brutal here. <laughs> I, I don't want to live here now. I, don't, I can't imagine living here fucking 200 years ago. I looked it up around Thanksgiving and with my address, it says to verify with the local nations, but it says that I was on the meat. Miamia, which is probably where we get Miami, Ohio stuff from. The oh. Shawandasi Tula or Shawnee, Kas- Kaskaskia, and the Hopewell people. So I've heard, I've heard of the Shawnee. I don't think I've heard of any of the rest of those. Why did I start saying that? I don't know, but now you got me on a Google fucking chase here to find out. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, there's a whole fucking shit fucking ton of them uh arapaho cheyenne crow eastern shoshone the ute i'm in the middle of the state and like a lot of these like kind of intersect in the fucking middle so uh hard to say broadcasting from the stolen land of many a first nation people almost too many to list there's mark you and I. Oh, hey, the last time I was on the show was April of last year. That's a long fucking time ago. It is a long time ago. I have like 10 months. 10 months you've been avoiding me. And I got you. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a busy, weird 10 months. I, I've changed jobs twice in that 10 months. <laughs> Ed got married. Congratulations. And got married. Thank you. Thank you. And went back to uh, school. Congratulations. Yeah, I went back to school very, very clumsily. I just tried to sign up for classes for the spring semester, I think like two days before Christmas fucking break, which was a terrible mistake. I, almost all the classes I wanted were like already full up, especially online stuff. Uh, so I managed to sneak into one psychology class, which uh, I didn't really want to take. My, I think my advisor just needed to fill some asses in an online class basically so <laughs> she's like it's an elective you should take it i'm like i don't really want to uh, my, my my wife is like getting ready to graduate is with a psychology de- degree if i want to know these things i'll just go fucking ask her i want to take like you know some art classes or some like uh, my, my, i'm shooting for english major I, I don't know. At some point I got in my head, I was like, eh, there's like always a demand for English teachers and Jesus Christ, our country needs fucking English teachers horribly. Cause have you seen the way these people write and like talk and uh, it's, it's, it's atrocious. But uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, probably we'll take more shit next semester. <laughs> like <laughs> at least like a few, few classes. I want to take some music classes also because I, definitely fucked that off in high school majorly and i feel like having a little bit more formal knowledge about the subject might help me out a lot even though i just make weird fucking bleeps and bloops but yeah anyway busy 10 months i can't even remember what the fuck we talked about the last time i was on the show i have no idea 
It's probably what, a comic book show, right? Yeah, it was probably a comic book show. Was that when we did The Crow? Uh, that sounds about right. Because I feel like The Crow was the last comic book we did, unless we did The Batman. We also oh, did that Oh, you're one. right. I, I, I think it was The Batman was the last, the last one I was on. That probably makes more sense, because I think when we did The Crow, it was closer to Halloween. Yeah, you're right. We could easily be looking this up and know it in like five seconds what the fucking last thing was. But it's more fun to guess, especially for the listeners. It, it is. <laughs> and, you know, I have actually been looking it up. And Just yes, confirm. episode 116, we discussed the Batman. But we discussed a lot of Batman. That's a long fucking episode, if I recall right. It is. And right before that, the episode before that, we did 30 Days of Night. Oh, shit. So we were away. Okay, we, we must have done that after Halloween because it was the, the winter yes. horror comic book movie, basically. And then af before 30 Days of Night, I had two episodes with Duncan. And then right before... Before those, we had Dread and The Crow, uh, with The Crow that, being that the earlier rascal one. Duncan, he's uh, you and him are about the only people I've podcasted with in the last like fucking year or so. I know, I know prior to that year, I had a whole lot of free time on my hands, so I'd like you know, guest spot on a shit ton of shows, but uh, yeah, it's uh, other than Duncan dragging me. Out of, out of bed very early Sunday mornings to record shows about fucking band movies <laughs> done. The the podcasting stuff's been kind of a, been kind of slow for here a little bit, which is totally fine. Like, I don't know, I kind of I go in, I come and go in waves of, you know, how much I want to do these things and how, you know, it, it's because it's always at least a little bit of a time commitment. Even if, uh, even if all I have to do is like watch one fucking movie or whatever, like, you know, I, it's still something that's on my plate for a little bit before that, you know, right. but, uh, th thankfully like you doing, you know, doing nasty in your shows, it's, it, it's definitely a lot easier because I've been recording with you guys for like fucking ever, like probably eight or nine years with Duncan and like, I don't know, six, seven years with you or something. I would say so. That sounds about right. Last 10 years are kind of a blur, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what I've been up to. Uh, yeah, the the music thing has kind of kind of become more my jam here lately. That's that, that's about all I got time for outside of work and school and shit. So uh, that's that's about all I've been up to. What, you, what the what have you been up to, man? The fucking news has been crazy. Oh yeah, uh, I I will say that school and work and uh a new spouse and music sounds like a lot going on. Uh, um, and I will say that I, after I switched from journalism to an English major, I took some uh, music classes. That was fun. I sort of, I'm, I'm about uh, from that. I took two piano classes in college and I became about as good as uh, inexperienced six or seven year old that's more than most people <laughs> so that's what i've been using uh trying to remember i still have one of the books from that class that i get out every once in a while to fucking practice but um i've speaking going back to i uh, we'll talk more about that sort of stuff i guess off <laughs> talking about english major shit uh, later on, I think do you be it'd be surprised some of the cool electives you can take that are connected to English majors. Some of the stuff that I had were history through comic books. Uh, that would be a fucking dope class. The films of Orson Welles and Stanley Kubrick. I know there's like a literary women and horror class that our college offered at some point. And this is not the university to be clear. This is our, oh, we'll, we'll go unnamed local community college. And they yeah, had a fucking class where like you sit around and read like Mary Shelley and then watch like movies and shit nice. all about women and horror, which that's, that sounds dope. That's definitely my wheelhouse. My piano classes were at, uh, the community, one of the community colleges here. So I did, yeah, I did my first two years at Columbus State University. 
and which I guess was uh, the building was my grandfather's high school back in the guy yeah, who's in World War Two. So the 30s, I guess, is probably when he was in high school. Damn. Um, but anyway, Ohio in the news, you say. I didn't see much about it besides local coverage for the longest time. The mainstream media is not covering it at all. I don't really know that. I, I find out all these things on Twitter, basically. Like, if something is happening, somebody is going to fucking be tweeting about it. It was largely, it, like, I think one of the, uh, there's a couple local reporters that I follow on Twitter. And they were like, okay, it's more like the news about the shit that's going on here isn't getting talked about on MSNBC or CNN or Fox at first. Um, right. But there were a lot of local people covering things and, you know, people on the ground, people that live there uploading shit to TikTok. We're talking about the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, I'm guessing is the main thing. Five or six cars that they have told us about so far about 180 miles to my east on the Pennsylvania Ohio border that's not very far away i mean it no. is but clouds of toxic waste fucking drifting your way yeah it's tough because agencies in america i've seen some people saying well you know if the government agency says that everything's fine then why don't you believe them and it's like well that's kind of what happens in America is a lot of the time they're telling the truth, but then every once in a while they come out with, Oh yeah, we were totally fucking lying to you about that shit for a long time. Uh, yeah. I mean, really you're, you're going to look at like Flint to be like, what the fuck man? Like clearly somebody, somebody signed off on shit that they probably should not have saying that, you know, <laughs> everything's fine. Look, look the other way. Nothing here, nothing going on here. Yeah. Ohio itself has a, despite having a 45% to 55% Democrat to Republican voter base, it is pretty much entirely run by Republicans because of gerrymandering and voter suppression yeah. and things like that. But uh, right. the governor, Mike DeWine, who was, I mean, especially during the government taking covid seriously times he did a press conference short-lived every day he did a press conference every fucking day talking about everything right, like he was should. on twitter talking about stuff right he almost lost his re-election because talking about covid made him a rhino to the republicans uh, those who aren't very political nerdy a rhino stands for republican in name only and he was getting attacked from the right, despite being extremely anti-reproductive choice, anti-union, anti-labor, anti-raising the minimum wage, anti-everything. He, he opposed so the... as right as right could be, except for he was talking about COVID, so people almost didn't re-elect him. Yeah, and he, you know, we locked down for like two months or something like that. And by locked down, it means... You had to order carry out and your have your deliver your groceries delivered if you didn't want to, you know, it was it was ridiculous, especially compared to Europe and the rest of the world. But they called it a lockdown. Right. We had the state house with those people like licking the fucking glass, looking like Night of the Living Dead pictures. If you remember <laughs> that, I do remember that state house is downtown here in Columbus. And there were people from all over the place coming to protest the COVID lockdown, even though they were allowed to leave their house and go to the Capitol, Capitol building. They were still being prevented from going to the gym or whatever the fuck they... Anyway, sorry. Governor DeWine... Those are fun times. Yes. Governor DeWine uh, said, pretty much said everything was okay. I mean, he did... There was uh, the first day or two, it was leave your house or you'll be arrested if you live in a certain mile radius from the train derailment. Right. And then it was go back. Ba this is the basic gist. You know, there's probably some things that I, I 
uh, am missing, but I've been following it and answering a lot of out of state questions. And uh, all the, I mean, there's been so many train derailments lately. I feel like it's got to happen yeah, every day, and we have another heard one about like it. today or whatever, someplace else. Yeah, there was one in Texas. I think the day after the one here in Ohio, that was outside Houston. I think there's one near Detroit that happened. But uh, I mean, the water in the area around the town in Ohio, where people were saying they were outside and their skin turned red and they were having trouble breathing, and their uh, the water looks like is it the raft? In creep show two, it's sort yeah. of reflecty well, like rainbowy, and uh, people are there's reports of dead animals downstream, dead fish. Um, you can go back into your home, but let us know if you want to check to see if your basement is a death chamber of gas. Jesus Christ, that that sort of shit. What was on the fucking train cars that derailed? Well, the second day they said the thing. I had it written down just it's in case. Some just awful, like un- unpronounceable element that we don't even yeah, like. Something the chloride. Layman doesn't even know what it is. But then there was another one that uh, a couple days later, because you have to test for specific poisons. You don't just do a test for all chemicals or anything like that. Right. Uh, so after they did the first test, when they told people they could go home, then the train company said, well, there was there was this, too. Oh, man. They, 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 they just got like an entire fucking train, like full of just awful things. They're like, <laughs> yeah, at, at least there's like a strong possibility. They might not even know what the fuck they're carrying. Like they're. they're uh, the the rail industry is kind of a hot mess right now. Yeah, vinyl chloride was the first thing that they told people about. Five cars of vinyl chloride, and when it derailed, part of the reason why they say it was derailed, and uh, there's footage that seems to corroborate claims that the train was on fire for 20 miles before it got to the town, the brake area of the train. Uh, it. It spans multiple presidencies. Okay, so the Obama administration uh, passed guidelines saying that trains carrying toxic chemicals needed to have, I can't remember it, but this specific brake system that's supposed to be an improved brake system with more fail safes than the old brake system. Then the Trump administration that government overreach and too too much regulation for the rail industry to cooperate with. Exactly, it would have cost them too much money, and that money needs to go to stock buybacks. The Trump administration said, "No, you don't." And then the Biden administration didn't say, "Uh, yeah, you do." And they also were, uh, it's not wholly this. I th- I think I've seen the oversimplified. Well, when Biden crushed that strike, this wouldn't have happened. A lot of other shit had to happen. But yes, this was one of the safety concerns that the rail workers were voicing before they were forced to sign the new agreement. Yeah, not only is their equipment fucked up, but yeah, they're they're working like the stupidest fucking schedules imaginable and aren't allowed to like take sick days basically is kind of the long and short of it, which... I mean, it's probably the same as is true for a lot of other industries, but uh, yeah, we're we're uh, at the fuck around and find out in the end of that phase here, <laughs> as far as rail workers go. Like these people should be able to take as much time off as they fucking need, and they should probably be getting paid better. And uh, yeah, we're we're about to ruin an entire state's fucking water supply because they didn't want to spend the money to operate safely. Vinyl chloride, either it was either the vinyl chloride or the other chemical that they said when they burned it so it didn't explode more. It released a gas that I that was used in World War One chemical warfare before. <laughs> oh, good. Before they signed those things saying that that's not good, even though everybody still does it. Uh, it, it was it up, uh, similar to mustard gas. I looked it up. Vi- vinyl chloride is used to make PVC, such as PVC pipe and packaging and coating and wires and shit. Ah, and when you so, 
burn it, it makes phosgene or phosgene, which is a gas that can be highly lethal and was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Uh, it's CBS, vinyl chloride's invisible threat. Thousands of pounds are released every year in the U.S. as part of plastic manufacturing. So, yay! Uh, but uh, yeah. as for government response, uh, that weaselly little governor that I was talking about, they usually had a press conference every day. He was pretty much not talking about it, uh, although he is presently a defendant in uh, gerrymandering lawsuits, and his name has brought been brought up quite a few times in the racketeering and bribery trial of the former House Speaker Larry ha- Householder. One of the defendants killed themselves when they were indicted, and it was... I think it was $61 million in bribery. It, uh, I don't want to say the number because I don't have it on the top of my head, but it was an energy company, apparently or allegedly, bribed the Speaker of the Ohio House to help pass a bailout of their nuclear plants and two of their coal plants in another state, and then also helped block the citizens initiative that was going to undo house bill six and undercover FBI agents that have recorded talks of transactions and money for support and things like that, uh, donated to his campaign or given to him personally in checks. The state attorney general has been brought up saying that he would have opposed the legislation, but since he, took campaign money from them. He decided not to oppose it. I mean, this is all being alleged in court right now. The trial just started last month. Uh, But also there's connections to the governor's aides. And sometimes he takes some time to sign things, but he signed that bill like within hours of it being passed. And going back off the... I don't want to say the derailed train, but talking about the derailed train, he waited quite some time. And then a few, there, there was a, there was a state response, but his main thing was just saying everything. I am told everything is fine. And then he was interviewed by somebody and he said, well, president Biden called and offered me federal help. So far, I have not called him back. And he sort of chuckled and because he chuckles a lot when he talks, or at least I think he does. Maybe it's just because I loathe him. (laughs) But he was like doing the Republican thing of like, oh, the Democrats offered help. We don't need their help. Don't worry about it. And people got really pissed. I mean, they had a town hall meeting in East Palestine and the rail company changed their minds and nobody from them showed up saying they were afraid for their physical safety. I don't know if it meant that they're they going to get their asses kicked or if it's like an Aaron Brockovich, I'm not going to go there and drink the water sort of shit. I don't know. Right. So yesterday, the, uh, the train derailed on the 3rd or 4th of February, and it is now after, what is this, the 17th? Anyway, the derailment was... Two weeks ago, and yesterday was when he announced that he reached out for federal aid. Uh, New Senator J.D. Vance. Weeks ago, yeah, I, I, I definitely, I think, just heard about it within like the last week or so. So maybe, maybe it did take for fucking ever for any kind of media coverage. Incom- incoming uh, new Senate. Yeah, the, the uh, derailment was February 3rd. J.D. Vance, we have a Republican senator and a Democrat senator. J.D. Vance is the Republican one. And he took 10 days before he said anything about it. And he showed up 10 days later to complain about lack of government reaction. I don't know. Maybe my perspective on this is weird because I come from such a teeny ass, like the least populated state in the country. But like if a fucking train crashed in Wyoming and had a bunch of toxic shit on it that was just like burning and maybe seeping into the fucking water supply and getting 
an entire fucking city worth of people fucking sick, it would be the biggest goddamn news like of the year for like pretty much anywhere in Wyoming. So, uh, I, I, I don't know. It, it's got to be like I don't know. <laughs> Not maybe necessarily like a cover up is kind of a bad you know that makes it sound like a conspiracy theory or something it's definitely there's an attempt being made to sweep the shit under the rug i would say is fairly realistic i kept looking for stuff and i kept only finding not i mean local journalism is where it's at but it just seemed odd to me cuz i i similarly thought that it should have been a bigger story and should still be a bigger story because I think worst case scenario, it's, you know, millions and millions of people being affected. And the, but the town itself, I think it has a pop population of about 5,000 people. So not, not a huge place, but 5,000 fucking sick people because it's a government government and a fucking corporation both fuck things up horribly. Like, uh, yeah. Should be bigger news for sure. I think that's the main fucked up thing going on around here. If that's what you meant by Ohio being in the news. Yeah, mostly that. I, unless there's unless there's other shit, which I'm sure there probably is, but that was the big one. The only other sort of national thing or thing that I think should be a national story is that they're redrawing... They're supposed to be redrawing our legislative maps again because in violation of the citizen pass initiative to try to combat gerrymandering uh the state passed a thing requiring a redistricting committee but it's made up of government officials but it's supposed to have a certain level of bipartisan agreement god it's like years of bullshit but basically it was mostly Republicans on the redistricting committee, but they never got the Democrats on the redistricting committee to agree to the map, which was ruled unconstitutional by the state Supreme Court five times. And they just said, fuck it. We're having elections anyway. And then they're going to work on drying the maps again. But since they didn't get in any sort of trouble doing that, I don't know what the fuck different is going to happen. And they are also trying to make it harder to pass citizen initiatives. They're going to keep it as easy for the state government to pass things with, you know, 51 percent vote. But they're trying to raise it to be at least 60 percent for citizen initiatives before anything else that they don't like happens. Which sucks because, uh, like, if I, if I recall right uh... – citizen initiatives are like how weed gets legal in a lot of places at least yes. like maybe or like decriminalized especially like on a city citywide basis or like i'm pretty sure uh denver legalizing or decriminalizing i guess magic mushrooms uh, i'm pretty sure started as a citizen because these things are never ever gonna get like introduced by you know as like a bill or anything like it's it's got to be like a fucking we have a bazillion signatures from people you have to fucking do something about this kind of deal. Yeah. They tried to hurry one in uh, before the deadline that would make the voting on the making it harder for citizens initiatives. They were trying to get it on the May primary, which has I mean, all American elections have piss poor attendance records, but a May primary in an off election year is I think the least, the worst. So they missed that deadline, but they took about two weeks to fight after the new Congress started in the state assembly. Then they came back with what is really important to the controlling supermajority of Republicans is they want to make it harder for citizens initiatives to pass. They want to get rid of income tax and they want to go after transgender high school athletes. Those are their main concerns to start off the legislative year. Yeah, I was uh, I was just looking up uh, 
Wyoming's got 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 a fun one, and I posted this a couple. I I, I gotta look this back up. Megan says hi, by the way. She's off to hi. off to work right at the moment. Hi, bye. Uh, Darren says hi and bye. <laughs> uh, let's see. Senate File One Seventeen prohibits schools from teaching kindergarten through third grade students about sexual orientation and gender identity. Several education officials and LGBTQ rights activists say it might prohibit teachers from supporting queer youth or even prohibit students from talking about themselves or their own families. The bill closely resembles the famed Don't Say Gay bill passed in Florida last year. This is from Wyoming Public Media. So that's fun. There's like It's the same bunch of fucking dick suckers on this thing that fucking introduce these dog shit bills. I don't know. I highly, I kind of doubt this is going to fucking pass, but it does. Uh, our Republican Senator Charles Scott, who's this fucking crusty old crypt keeper looking motherfucker. That's like super Republican comes from like, I think they're mostly like cattle ranchers. So like the Scots are in a huge fucking family here that are insanely fucking wealthy. Uh, and somebody named Bo Reitman, who's a Republican from Ranchester, which is a, a fucking stupid, shitty little town that's outside of Sheridan, Wyoming, which is kind of becoming our new Jackson, which is where all the fucking yuppies are moving. Uh, I used to deliver doors and windows up there not very long ago. And uh, yeah, so uh, fuck these people. Why is it like... Uh, like Charles Scott, I can maybe understand because he is from, here from Casper, which were the second biggest city in Wyoming, uh, Cheyenne, our capital being the first. But uh, yeah, I don't know what the fuck this little dude from Ranchester. How do these people get elected? Like uh, anyway, but that's about it for Wyoming politics. Uh, I've been paying too much attention to here lately. That one fucking pissed me off. Fuckery's afoot. Start fucking start voting people <laughs> going to our, our our local school board meetings are fucking insane nowadays, too. We've got some crazy fucking can't even remember the organization that they're with. But they're 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 a bunch of people that are very much against like, yeah, any teaching anything about like gender orientation to children or or adults, even for that matter, or, you know, stuff like critical race theory and uh, big into book banning. Uh, I guess that's how we could, could maybe kind of segue into the the. the presumably, we came here to talk about X and Pearl, the the Thai West horror duology that's out. I kind of, I kind of mentioned, you know, I I basically just saw that you'd watched X pretty recently. It was like I fucking love X, and I haven't really got a chance to talk, you know, at length about it too terribly much on a podcast here lately. So <laughs> I was like. Uh, we can loosely tie it to like, you know, it's a movie about making porn. So like censorship and, uh, there's all these fucking weirdos on Twitter nowadays. I don't know if you've seen any of these tweets where people are complaining and saying that like, they don't think there should be nudity or sex scenes in any movie ever again, because it makes them uncomfortable and they should like, so some people were even like, it should be illegal to put sex scenes in movies and, uh yeah uh americans would be having flashbacks to the haze code but since i'm so deeply in ingrained into the fucking whole video nasty thing that's that's what i thought of it was like oh they want to bring back censor censorship that's super fun uh, well, we do have international listeners so feel free to expound on that well the the video nasty uh there's a great huge documentary that Severn put out that you can get on DVD still for pretty cheap. That explains it a lot better, but in kind of a nutshell, uh, during the eighties, like when VHS was first starting to become like a big deal, they, uh, it was kind of an unregulated market. And there was, I mean, there was like, there, there was a rating system in place for films in theaters, kind of like there was, uh, here in the States, but uh, the, there was still a, a lot of, you know, anxiety and fear around 
how open the film market became once home video became a thing. Like basically anybody could make a fucking movie, get it printed on however many copies of VHS and get it out to the market. And uh, a lot of, you know, exploitation film became super transgressive kind of around the late seventies and early eighties. So all of a sudden, like, you know, there's this huge concern about, having stuff like cannibal Holocaust in your home where a kid can see it. And like, it, it got to the level of insanity where like there was an actual like child murder somewhere in the UK and it was blamed on child's play three. Like the, like the, the, the media whipped people up into a frenzy thinking that like, you know, the fact that you could go to a shop and buy or rent you know, a horror movie was like warping the country basically and ruining like it was a, it was a big moral upheaval and, you know, uh, the pornography, uh, I'm pretty sure like I, I've studied that a little bit less because it doesn't really come up in talks about the video nasty stuff. Like these were, you know, I, uh, stuff like Deep Throat and like Debbie Does Dallas and The Farmer's Daughter, which is apparently a real fucking porn movie that's regional to somewhere. I'm sure it's, or at least I'm pretty sure. So somebody posted, it might might have see it might have been like an AI thing or something that somebody just like whipped up, you know, of an actual VHS. But I, I'm gonna go ahead and just believe that there is an actual movie called The Farmer's Daughter that Ty West based the, 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 the scrappy group of pornographers that are protagonists in X who are very charming people and are all played by like really great actors. And I kind of love this movie just, just for that, that like, you know, like that, that's maybe not the main takeaway. There, there's a lot you can take away from X, but that was one thing that was just like, he's really, he really is like standing up for, you know, the harder edges of art basically especially like cinema you know and but pearl pearl dips into that a little bit too with the guy at the theater that's like big into stag films in 1920 or whatever the fuck year that takes place but yeah that's <laughs> that, that that was the whole spiel for that that was my pitch to darren and like about two instant messenger messages <laughs> that i just took 10 minutes to explain um, but yeah, uh, X is fucking great. I saw that one and I, I was shocked that we like actually got that at our local theaters because who the fuck besides me and like 10 other people. And sure enough, we were there like the first screening on opening day and there was like my two, me, my two friends and like two other people in the theater, but was, somehow it made some money and was like, I think kind of destined to be like a cult classic and yeah, like unbeknownst to a lot of people there was already a sequel a prequel actually like shot back to back I, I always thought that was an interesting thing about pearl x and pearl is that they were shot back to back because they were filmed in new zealand and i think they left to go shoot that stuff like shortly after covid lockdown happened so it was kind of just a clever way for them to recycle like actors and sets and they basically got two movies for the price of one kind of deal and they're both fucking great but they, these came out in what 2022 and 2022 or 2022 and 2020 when did pearl come out well i guess uh, before we go just in case spoiler <laughs> alert spoiler alert spoiler alert i don't know if we're gonna go as yeah. in depth as we might on super old movies but i'm glad i didn't watch it first first even though it's chronologically first but i think i told you that i was on some uh legal ohio medicine and i kept thinking during my first watch through of x that the pearl character seemed a lot like maxine and so i was didn't know if since i knew it was part of a planned trilogy is that, or is there just yeah, the two there's movies? Yeah, there's a third third one coming soon that's a sequel to X that will be following Maxine, which is about all all I know about it. I think it's supposed to take place in the 80s, so it'll probably be a few years later. But yeah, that'll be fun. And yeah, it is weird that the 
the prequel comes in the middle of the trilogy. You know, and you're totally right. You should watch them in, I don't know about Maxine, but in X and then Pearl afterwards, it makes a lot more sense. I, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to say because I didn't watch them that way, but I would be curious to hear somebody's opinion to watch them the first time in chronological order. I think for one, it takes away a lot of suspense and surprise and horror from X because Pearl oh, Pearl yeah, isn't totally. so much. A, I don't even know what the, the, how to like fucking describe it. If it existed on its own, I mean, it's they're both beautifully shot, of course, and I like how they both open with shots of the house, even though it's very different times for the house. But if after seeing Pearl, it added texture to the first movie. But if I yeah. had seen that first, I it, it totally would have led my viewing of X in a different way. Yeah, and you're you're totally right. It would it would have ruined a lot of the suspense, and because you don't know you don't know for sure what exactly like if you just go into this like not having watched the trailer or anything. If you go into X cold, like you know, you know it's a horror movie, so you're pretty sure something bad's gonna happen, but you don't really like you know you get pretty bad vibes from Howard like right off the bat and Pearl is, you know, lurking in the fucking shadows, but like gets introduced pretty quickly and is immediately like, uh, there's definitely something off. It takes uh, another thing. Yeah. Another thing I really like about X is it takes a sweet time before it gets to any of the horror. And I genuinely like every single one of these characters and actors. And you know, this is, uh, this, this is a fucking amazing cast for the kind of movie that on the surface X is. It's, it's a silly fucking horror movie that A24 put out, but X is definitely, it's got some fucking layers to it. And so, you know, there, there, there's, there, it's got a lot to say. And some of it I found really sad, especially about, you know, Pearl and Howard and, you know, the, the passage of time and how fucking, like miserable they basically are and like they they, they have a fucked in you know decades maybe definitely years it kind of sounds like and yeah you know mia goth is fucking gorgeous too so like i mean you think about her as like an 80 or 90 year old i don't, I don't know that's a, well, that may sound a little shallow of me, but like you know, lo losing your good looks as you as you age has got to be a fucking drag when you're as gorgeous as she is, and the the type of person that she is, especially once we've seen Pearl. But I think she she makes it pretty clear what she thinks about and the things that she appreciates or values in herself and people in X. It's largely looks and romance. Yeah. And I, I guess, well, at least Howard hasn't fucked in a long time. It kind of sounds like part of their homicidal kink is getting, I don't know. The first time I thought I, for, I, thought that the uh, the person in the basement was JR, but that's not right. It's not? Who the fuck is it then? Okay. I think it's Howard goes off on a rant about that last bohemian that stayed here traipsing around in, you know, barely any clothes, but oh. there's a later part where another character runs into JR uh where we last saw him so he's uh remind me which which one's JR is he the oh, younger guy he is Jenna Ortega's boyfriend slash the filmmaker uh, what is what is her character's okay. name that one guy just calls her church mouse uh Lorraine yeah uh JR is the long-haired filmmaker that uh gets his why are you such a prude line thrown back in his face and he doesn't know how to handle it 
which we'll, we'll get back to that here in just one second. I didn't realize until this watch when I looked up, like I, I was trying to, I think a lot of people confused that actor with the dude from the Evil Dead remake that opens the fucking... <gasps> opens oh. the book of the dead because they, they're like dressed the exact same and have the exact same haircut and are, are very similar. That's not actually him. I don't know who the fuck that guy is, but uh, the, the dude in this movie is, I think his name is Owen Campbell. And I looked it up and he is in a couple of fucking bangers from the last couple of years. He's in super dark times. Uh, I haven't seen that in a couple of years. I, I saw that at fantastic fest a few years ago and it fucking knocked me on my ass. So I forget which one. I think that was filmed quite a while ago. So I think he's he's one of the kids in that. I think he's the fucked up creepy kid, and he's also the fucked up creepy brother in My Heart Can't Beat Unless You Tell It To, which I don't know if you saw that one, but another movie that just like, oh dude, it was like getting hit with a fucking atomic bomb. It fucking <laughs> made me feel things that I didn't know. <laughs> I I didn't know I needed to feel basically, but. Uh, yeah, a little, little side tangent. That dude is a fucking great actor, and he, I, he's he's pretty great in this too. And he's playing, he's playing a really difficult part, I think, because he he he's he's got to be the jackass, which we would all like to think that we'd be, you know, the 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 other hip cool people. But uh, in reality, most of us would probably be him, and would be like, Nah, I don't want my fucking innocent little girlfriend banging in your fucking porn movie so <laughs> that, that was another thing i took away from this is what it has to say about i yeah i guess about sexuality which i mean it's like you know you'd be like no duh it's a fucking movie about pornographers but uh like more than that like just about like what is like what is sexual freedom to people and like you know what because that dude really like i mean they might be it kind of barely sounds like the two characters are actually like dating or whatever like i, I don't know I, it's not really my place to judge like other especially fictional people's <laughs> relationships but like even still like he doesn't own her like she she is she is her own person and she can make her own fucking decisions and like he really in a way, it doesn't even really have a place to say, like, no. I mean, he can, but, like, it's, you know, I think even in 1979, well, especially in 1979, I mean, this is well past, you know, the women's lib movement and, you know, feminism and stuff like that. Like, uh, the, the, that's that's more along, you know, if this, if this was like a sliding scale of uh, how, you know, actually and i guess to a degree perceived sexually free these people are uh owen campbell's on the far left and maxine's on the far right basically uh, you got anything to add to that kind of kind of bit like I, I i i i feel like this had a lot to say and i'm having difficulty vocalizing some of it i feel like i hear what you're saying and rj i kept saying jr it's who RJ. shot jr yeah who shot jr it wasn't Kid Cutie, who I didn't realize was Jackson in this movie. I don't know much about Kid Cutie's music, but I know them from the last Bill and Ted movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think Maxine had a cool little speech when they were all sitting around and uh, Lorraine was sort of talking through her evolution of sexual morality after the first day of shooting where you can't really help who you're attracted to. You can choose who you love, but that's different. And also yeah. a thing that they were talking about with when the camera's on, it's not the same as real life in a way. And the connection of, uh, well, you know, Nudity and horror go all the way back. Nudity and movies and film go all the way back because people like to see other people naked. But it's hard to tell how old RJ is, but he is referred to as the kid that, was it Wayne? Is that the executive producer of this I think so, and I think he call he he Wayne has a line where he's like, I, 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 you, you don't know what it's like to be 
oh. 40 something, but I know what it's like to be 23. Yeah, I think, you've is what you've it never says. been 42, but I have been 25, I think yeah. is the line. And it, yeah, it's about the evolution of perspective and things. And I know I was a much more jealous person the younger I was. Um, but I don't know if it's. Oh, yeah, definitely growing into confidence or whatever. But I, I remember f being bothered by things that don't bother me today. And uh, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but and not just, uh, not just it, about it, sex either. It, it being but. insecure. Yeah, I was definitely more insecure about myself at 25. Much more insecure about myself when I was 25. And also just didn't understand, you know, the psychology of, not just people, but especially women that like, the, well, okay. That sounds kind of sexist. That's what I mean is like sexual or romantic partners. Yeah. I, I didn't, I especially didn't understand the psychology of women at the age of 25 for sure. Cause I, you know, that's at that age that that was primarily who I was trying to date was women. And yeah, I, just, I, I, I hadn't learned enough hard lessons at that point about <laughs> how not to act around women and how not to, you know, how to run a woman off. That's those are those are the hard lessons you got to learn mostly hopefully in your 20s and maybe to a degree your early 30s. Some people take their whole fucking lives to learn these lessons. Let's let's be frank, and you know, still don't ever get it figured out. <laughs> our our country, especially, holy shit, has got a problem with how how men treat women. Uh, you know, <laughs> Jesus Christ, so many alpha fucking, males out there. Oh yeah, the fucking the the in, the incel movement is. Uh, <laughs> a, a wacky phenomenon of our lifetime. I, mean, I would love to explain to somebody in Pearl's time what a fucking incel is, and uh, <laughs> yeah, to to a degree, I I feel like they're littered about both of these movies. There's, there's a nice little fuck used to like you know how how women are treated in our entertainment and just in general our you know our society or whatnot. But it also like you know the, the, I I've started rewatching Pearl a little bit this afternoon, but I didn't go all the way through it. But like one of the earlier lines that really struck me was when Pearl is walking in the barn and talking to the animals, and she says something along the lines of like, "Mom doesn't know that I'm special. <laughs> she's gonna or she's gonna feel awfully foolish when she finds out that I'm special." And I'm just like, oh, my God, it's like, you know, fucking everybody now. It's that's the generation that everybody thinks that they're the fucking star of their own movie. And like the fucking I am sound super grandpa -y here. I know but like this is, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm 36, so I'm only a fucking millennial here. So don't come at me with pitchforks or whatever. I'm guilty of it, too, um, you know. Gotta gotta be Mr. Podcaster and you know doing doing my thing and showing myself off to the world kind of, but like you know it's 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 just become you know more more abundant. It was probably there was probably just as many other people around the country that like thought that way, about, you know that Pearl did, and I don't know that that's kind of the cool thing about art though is that like when you get inspired by other art you know like you going and seeing the seeing the new silent picture the new the new talkie for a fucking penny down the street and you say i i would i want to do that that is cool like i could maybe do that like that, that that's that's a cool thing but it can be a dangerous thing also as you know like i said the 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 live stream and the tiktoker and the that whole fucking generation which uh you know, there, there's great things about that. Like, I would probably have never met you if it wasn't for all of us wanting to, you know, have our voices heard on the fucking internet and making a making a whole show and a whole production out of it. I've met some of my best friends that way. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoy the conversation for the conversation's sake. Much like when I was active in bands, it was, you know, play the show. It doesn't matter if there's anybody watching, but it would be cool if there was. 
Yeah. It's mostly you just want to make the show or do the show or do the thing. Yeah, we're we're singing our song right now and if we weren't doing it, I would be doing it by myself in my garage. <laughs> it's it's better with company. And uh I got to make use of uh my my past and your future English degrees by discussing film. But I cut you off. What were you saying? I, I can't even remember. I, I I got a little bit stoned in the middle of the show at some point. Uh, <laughs> Pearl's going to get you. Is she? Is, 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 uh, well, I guess she's not bothered another... by it, but there is some uh, sweet, sweet Mary Jane smoked in X. I do like that all the participants in the film seem to be equal partners. It's sort of like a socialist uh, film thing. Everybody's going to get their cut for the work that they've done. And everybody's doing it seemingly with full consent rather than any pressure from anybody. Yeah. Especially the character of Wayne. Like, Wayne is like, I'm hoping that's his name. Again, I'm not going to. I'm too fucking lazy to look this up and count bad with names anyway, but we'll, we'll call him Wayne. Uh, he He's a character that like could potentially veer off into unlikable skis bag territory in the hands of a lesser actor and a lesser director and a lesser writer. Um, but I actually like, I, 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 I respect Wayne. I think he's a dipshit because Maxine is like, she's, she's trouble. Like, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, it's Mia Goth. I, I could probably tolerate quite a bit of trouble for Mia Goth. <laughs> but like, she, she's definitely, she's got a little bit of a fucking coke habit. That was another thing I was thinking about, is that, like, cocaine is not really shown as, like, a negative thing at all in this movie. It's not really shown as, like, a glamorous thing either. It's just kind of there as it would be probably in 1979, especially... Like in regards to her character, like I could very much see her just like she she runs on fucking ambition and cocaine. Yep. Whether she's driving or being driven, Maxine's got to do the cocaine. And uh, Martin Henderson did play Wayne. He's a New Zealand actor. No shit. Everybody in this movie's probably got accents that are not Texas, and they they all pull it off pretty well, I'd say. I mean, what Mia Goth was, uh, what she was born in England, I thought. I went in, like you said, going into this cold. I knew that I wanted to watch X at some point. I didn't even uh, know that Jenna Ortega was in it. I but had completely I... forgotten. Like until I saw this on home video and that was after either after or shortly before we watched the fucking Wednesday series, which yeah, blew my mind. We're in the middle of the Wednesday series. I also just covered American Carnage, which is a Jenna Ortega movie. And then uh, that's right. Uh, fuck. Some other movie that I, I watched she was in. And it just seems like I've everything I've watched lately has had Jenna Ortega in it. But I had heard people make comments about Mia Goth. Isn't she in Infinity Pool with the Skarsgård guy? Uh, yes, which I have not seen yet, but uh, yeah. came out on VOD a couple days ago, so I may need to correct that. That uh, that actually did play at our local theaters, but it only played for like a fucking week, and I totally missed it. So that's uh one that the the misses is interested in watching. Uh, so anytime that she's into watching a horror because she used to be super hardcore into horror movies and she's kind of backed off of it lately. So anytime that she wants to watch one, I try to avoid watching until she's ready. I got, I got put on the list for infinity pool for that same reason. I just heard people talk about Mia goth. All I knew about X was that it was a horror movie based on people shooting a porn. That that's right. like all I do. I didn't watch any of the I'm not in the anti trailer crowd or whatever, but often I will skip it if I already know I'm gonna watch the thing, just in case. I don't Yeah, I was kind of the same way with this. I th- I think I read about it and was like a uh, new Thai West horror movie, uh about pornographers getting m- murdered probably. I'm like, all right, I'm sold. Yeah. Which is weird because like I don't have a great 
a great history with Ty West movies. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on House of the Devil? See, I am a fan of House of the Devil. You you are not a fan, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm a fan of like about four minutes of it, and the rest of it I think <laughs> is fucking horribly boring. I don't remember thinking much of the innkeepers, but I don't I remember. Totally thought I'd seen that one, but I don't think I have. He's actually got quite a few fucking movies I have not seen. I haven't seen the innkeepers. I haven't seen the sacrament. See some of these I don't he like. Have your next listed here? I know I don't, he did not direct that. He's in it. I'm pretty sure, but um, Cabin Fever Two. I know he disowned that movie, but uh, it's 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 fun and bad in like a trauma kind of way. I don't know. I kind of <laughs> I kind of dig Cabin Fever Two. You don't you don't have a strong affinity for Ty West. Yeah, not not especially, but for whatever reason, I was excited about this one. I don't, I don't know, like. He he's done some stuff that I thought was pretty okay, like Cabin Fever Two, and but yeah, I just, I don't I don't I don't really know what the hook was for this one. I think it also came out in like February or something, so that was like, you know, any any horror movie that looks even halfway decent that comes out in fucking February, I'm probably gonna be all about. It came out in March in the states, so yeah, early spring is a weird time to put out a horror movie, so I was probably hungry for something along those lines uh mia goth's fucking wikipedia page is goddamn banana pants she was married to shia labeouf from 2016 to 2018 oh really yeah i had no idea uh she is brazilian british and canadian and uh, she's in the Suspiria remake, apparently, which I it's been a couple years since I've seen that. So I don't remember who the fuck she might be in that. She's also in A Cure for Wellness. A whole bunch of shit I have not seen, but I remember a thing I saw her in. Go ahead. I, I no, What have you seen her in? I just said I remembered it. And now I'm like, well, huh. it was Is it Nymphomaniac. No, it was. Also Mayday. I saw her in Mayday. The I think that was Mayday. 2020 or 2021. It's a weird it's bleak movie where I don't know what to say without giving too much away, but uh, she was in it. Juliette Lewis was in it. It's like a girl ends up in an alternate reality. And... Yeah, I got the synopsis here in front of me. Oh, it says, okay. a young woman is transported to another world where a never-ending war is raging. There, a clutch of women lure men to their deaths at sea via radio transmissions like 20th century sirens. She soon realizes she's not the killer they want her to be. Uh, this sounds fucking rad. Yeah, uh, I forget where. I think Amanda read about it in Bitch Magazine or something like that. <laughs> and we, we watched it. What the fuck it. is Bitch Magazine? It, it's a feminist magazine. Sounds, I love the title. <laughs> uh, we used to have a subscription to it, but I think now it's all digital. Uh, but yeah, it's cool, and it's yeah, it's World War One or World War Two sort of motif. I, I would just say it's weird and cool and dark and worth watching. But I think that was the only thing besides the Suspiria remake that I definitely remember her from. Well, I don't remember her definitely from Suspiria, but I saw it. I seen it. She's a great actor. Yeah, and didn't she help write Pearl? I think so. Uh, or... She's definitely listed as like an executive producer. I think she did. Uh, yeah, she's listed as a screenplay with Ty West. Okay. So, I mean, especially with it taking place, and it makes sense. I This very well could have been planned ahead, but... If you're sort of trapped in New Zealand, trapped in New Zealand, but you know, if you can't leave New Zealand and you're going to work on a movie and the timeline lines up and you're sort of stuck there because of COVID restrictions, totally makes sense to have a movie that takes place around 1918 because that's when the, uh, they called it the Spanish flu back then, but everybody fucking had it. They just wanted to make people prejudice against the Spanish. Pearl's husband is fighting in World War One, and I think 
what she says in X that he fought in both world wars. Um, I think she, I think she tells Maxine that when they're talking in the house, he fought two wars for me. Not a lot. He wouldn't do for me. Just fucking nuts. Was that like a, there couldn't have been very many dudes that fought in both wars. Yeah, so what I World War One was going on in nineteen eighteen, nineteen nineteen, and American involvement in World War Two wasn't until after Pearl Harbor, nineteen forty one, forty or forty one. So if he was eighteen in nineteen eighteen. So yeah, because X is 1979, so yeah, you'd be 79 years old. That's, I mean, that lines up, I just don't think realistically, I, mean, I could be wrong. So somebody out there could probably correct us if there was actually, like, a good cross-section of, you know, dudes of a certain age that fought in both fucking wars. That seems horrible and cruel to send a man to fucking war twice. Then you wonder if he went voluntarily both times. That's because true. Of, I was thinking that because of his character and because of what he comes home to after <laughs> yeah, his wife. He's like, "Fuck that! I'm going back to war. <laughs> Send me to Germany. I don't give a shit." Pearl's mom is German. We don't. I don't know if they talk about where her dad is from, but I think both of her parents were immigrants. But her mom's definitely yeah. German. Speaks German to her a lot. Especially when she's being shitty. Oh, yeah. That fucking... I gotta look up who that actress is, because she is fucking incredible. The plays Pearl's mom. She is super scary. <laughs> it's just, like, the, 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 you know, little parts of all of the worst, like, horror moms that are just, like, awful and abusive and gaslighty and, like... But also, like, there there's a hint of, you know maybe why she is the way she is and it's because her fucking husband you know developed some disease i don't know did they ever say what's wrong with the husband no they just said he's sick or he's infirm yeah he's infirmed i forgot what i was looking for there for a second I, we're kind of talking about both movies at the same time but and we're i don't think we've given any big surprises away yet but I'm trying to think of other obvious parallels between the two movies that can be talked about. Like the, okay. When, when Pearl is looking through the window in X watching Maxine, it is kind of like when in Pearl, the projectionist puts the movie on and she's peeking through that little window. They both could stand alone, but together they do tell a, a full long story. I think Mia Goff was great in X, but that monologue in Pearl where she's pretending to be talking to Howard is fucking one of the stronger scenes in both movies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she that's like fucking career defining shit right there. Like that whole. <laughs> I kind of forget. I I didn't make it that far on the on the rewatch. And Pearl, I have only seen once prior to this. So we we picked that. I, that was another one I missed in the theaters. We, we but uh, after after we watched X, Megan got me Pearl on Blu-ray for Christmas because she really liked X and just wanted to see Pearl. Basically, I'm like, well, hell yeah, I'll add it to my Blu-ray collection. <laughs> uh, so I kind of forget what her because the the monologue we're talking about is like towards the end of the film. She's talking to, is that her cousin? Who the hell is that uh, other younger chick? It's her sister-in-law. It's her missing husband's sister. Okay, that's it. And yeah, it's after <laughs> her sister-in-law has uh, discovered all of the, uh, well, uh, the, the bad things that Pearl has been up to in her spare time. And I don't know what the hell is your monologue about, kind of. She's just like she's talking about, like basically justifying, like you know, maybe not murdering her fucking parents. Spoiler alert: if if you made it this far, I mean, none of this is really 
Right. Shouldn't be surprising. It's, it's not it's not going to ruin your experience with this. You just still if you haven't seen this and you made it this far, you just still go watch it. Cuz she starts it out with not really knowing how to deal with it and not knowing how to talk to Howard about what's been going on. So their sister-in-law says, you know, we'll just pretend like I'm Howard and you can practice. And it starts out with a brutal line like, I hate you so much for leaving that sometimes I wish you were dead. And then she goes into this long thing about loneliness and losing her mind and the feelings and urges that she gets and justifying the things that she's done uh, violently or sexually with what's happening to her and feeling alone and feeling like she doesn't matter and how she wanted to get away from her life. And all he wants is the life that she's trying to get away from. And then he leaves her with the life she wanted to get away from and stuff. That's right. And she cries during it. And I mean, it's just two people at a table and it's a powerful scene. I think I remember reading somewhere that they did like three takes of that. And that was Mm. the, that was the one. Tandy Wright plays her mom. Yep, uh, yeah, I, I had that in front of me. She's a New, New Zealand actress in a bunch of shit I have never seen, but she she's real good. The set dressing for both both films seems so just attention to detail everywhere you look in both movies. Uh, one thing I noticed was the the baby dolls because there's like a weird like almost jump scare in X with the, you know, like dirty and dusty, creepy baby dolls. One of which has blue eyeshadow, which is a thing that like kind of, I don't remember if it's really in Pearl at all, but in X kind of goes back and forth because Maxine's wearing this blue eyeshadow. And after Pearl, creepy old Pearl has been spying on her. You should, you know, she, there's a shot of her busting out some, blue eyeshadow and there's also a creepy baby doll which yeah they 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 reappear in pearl all nice and cleaned up like i think they literally did just use the exact same like like house for both movies and i they they shot x first so i imagine the house was probably in like not super great shape and they found it and you know basically rented it out and then they got to fix it up for Pearl and make it look, you know, old than uh, the people that own the property said they were going to keep it like that. They're like how it looks in Pearl is how it still probably looks. Oh, cool. And of course it's an A24 movie. I didn't know that either before I watched it. It's like 30 movies that A24 put out last year that I haven't fucking seen. If it's A24, I wonder if it's going to pop up on, I think Showtime has a A24 collection on their streaming site, which is often available for a week or two free trial uh, through right. iTunes and other places. I, I think they're I connected to shit. Paramount Plus now. I think it's it, it, there's going to be one channel eventually, but I think Paramount bought Showtime. If I remember. Okay. Yeah. I think I heard something about that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you're right. So I I remember seeing something about that because I don't know if you watched the season one of a series called Yellow Jackets. I did not. I have heard really good things though. It's, it's super sweet. It's like uh, an oversimplification would be to say it's kind of like Lord of the Flies in the 80s with a girls soccer team. But it goes that back and pretty rad. It goes back and forth from remembering what happened in the 80s when they were a high school soccer team that their plane crashed and they were out in the middle of nowhere. And some of the people are adults also, and that stuff's going on in their adult life. Uh, Christina Ricci plays the adult version of one of the girls. Uh, Juliette Lewis plays the adult version of, I think, the punk girl. You know, there's an 80s punk girl in there. Um, 
and then uh, what's her name? I think she's an Australian or New Zealand actress uh, that was in uh, Dangerous Creatures or whatever. Uh, and but I'm a cheerleader. Melanie Linsky. Does that name sound familiar? Uh, nope, but she might be in it. Uh, looking up the cast. Yeah, uh, yep, that's her. Okay, okay, I know her. She's uh, Last of Us, if I recall, right? Okay, I haven't started watching that yet. And uh, Sophie Thatcher from like the upcoming Stephen King movie Boogeyman, and uh, I think she was in the Book of Boba Fett, and a couple other things. She plays the young version of uh, the Juliette Lewis character. Uh, but it, it was a uh, one season long, but they have been working on season two. I think season two premieres uh, in March or April of this year, 2023. I think Elijah Woods in season two. I think I heard that as well. But speaking of visual media that uh, my wife read about in Bitch Magazine... I think that's where we heard about Yellow Jackets also. Uh, it's definitely recommended. To see if I got a free trial somewhere of Showtime, because <laughs> I ain't paying for that bullshit right now. Not going to take out a student loan to subscribe to all the <laughs> subscription channels? Nope. Uh, pinching every, the, I'm a broke college student now. I got to fucking pinch every goddamn penny and eat ramen noodles and snickers bars for fucking every meal and uh yeah it's been fun <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how much more i have to say about x and pearl i these are, these are both great which is your which which do you like better i like x more i think i i, I do too it's it's more it's more of a horror movie pearl's a little bit lighter on horror like there's still some like it's 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 more i wouldn't call it a slow burn because like house of the devil is like the ultimate oh. fucking slow burn movie and it just like barely crosses the line of like my patience at least the couple <laughs> times i've watched it where i'm just like this movie is too fucking slow uh but pearl is like i think it's only no, it's not quite two hours but it, it moves at a pretty steady clip especially on the rewatch it's an hour and 42 minutes and it moves pretty fast but it's not quite as much as what like i would consider an out and out fucking horror movie x is like that's kind of the great thing about x is i it feels like like the the sub the subtext is subtext it's never like you know screaming a fucking message like in your face so like depending on kind of what you're looking for in a horror movie and how you appreciate them i think x has something to offer for everybody like you it, it's it's got just enough like you know kind of deep shit about it like the nerds like us can talk for <laughs> two fucking hours about it at great length but if you just want to go into it like having a fun fucking horror movie that's got some pretty gnarly gore and just like some some great fucking characters and great actors uh, x is like x is definitely one of my favorite movies and definitely one of my favorite horror movies from last year so uh, I do strongly recommend that. And then if you like X, I, yeah, you should definitely watch Pearl also. Uh, two different, di very different, maybe not very different, but pretty different movies, uh, but kind of about the same, same kind of things a little bit. But yeah, I, th I think that's about all I got to say about those two. If you, listen, you, you got some more you want to add? No, not really. I mean, it doesn't seem gratuitous when we're, when you were talking about people complaining about nudity and stuff in movies, when I was thinking of movies where it doesn't make sense to me, why all of a sudden there's a fuck scene. It's usually an action movie or something. <laughs> it's, it's hard to take a lot of the sex scenes in horror seriously. Cause they are just so fucking goofy and like for and even amongst the stuff that we've covered on doing the nasty that was on the fucking band list that's what kind of boggles my mind is like these people on twitter weren't complaining about like violent fucked up rape scenes that are in plenty of fucking movies they were like talking about like you know they, they weren't super specific but i'm pretty sure they were talking about fairly mainstream things where it's 
literally just like a sex scene or even just like people kissing as uh people fucking like tweeting that, that makes them uncomfortable and i'm just like what the fuck like i don't these people grow up fucking no offense to the amish but like <laughs> <laughs> i got i don't know if so like twitter is the wrong fucking place for you twitter is the garbage the sewer drain of the fucking internet where people just go to get eviscerated on a daily basis i've been canceled on twitter at least once for saying stupid shit so uh like you know what the fuck are you, if, if you're offended by a kiss on tv what are you doing on twitter what do they say in star Wars? more wretched hive of scum and villainy <laughs> it's where the bad kids hang out <laughs> it's run by the king of the trolls yeah oh boy that guy is fucking man like the, the the captain of the ship is fucking drunk blindfolded and locked himself in his room and like <laughs> all everything bad is ha- happening on the, the the twitter ship that fucking shit is falling the fuck apart speaking of falling apart let's talk about pearl's mom's hair but that hairbrush <laughs> is in both movies also uh oh yeah so yeah, it's it's a good continuity. It's good, uh, very definitely a good use of time being kind of left with a, a movie set. And I, I mean, I think I meant to say this earlier, but set against the background of the 1918 flu and wearing masks and feeling isolated, it sounds like a perfectly organic film to come out of being stuck on a film set at the onset of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that that was that was kind of one of my when I when I read that I I think that was probably before I'd seen either of these movies cuz it was announced like pretty shortly after I think X had a few like preview screenings or whatever. They're like, "Hey, by the way, there's like a whole fucking prequel to this movie also shot that's coming out pretty soon and later shot back to back during COVID bullshit in New Zealand." And uh yeah, the, the cynic in me also like imagines the the pitch that Ty West made to A24 or whoever put forth the fucking money for this these two movies. He's like, "Hey, we're we're stuck in New Zealand like for and, like I think we have to quarantine for 2 weeks before we can even get started and we cranked out a script for this movie Pearl and uh it's not going to cost very much cuz we're going to use the same actors and sets and bullshit and like the a24 people are just <laughs> see the dollar signs like are you fucking kidding me of course go for it that was probably the fastest and easiest green light a fucking movie has ever gotten was for pearl and easy to recommend if you like x if you don't like x yep. you might like it because it's different enough but it's more of a you know the horror cops might have some questions from people who say that Pearl is a horror movie, but I don't think that they would uh, even momentarily detain anybody that says X is a horror movie. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's the internet. There, there's some dickwad out there that you can get a horror movie about basically everything. So we don't we don't take those people seriously in my house. And I'm looking forward to what's the third one, Maxine. Yep, Maxine, and it's got three X's in the middle of it, so I assume yeah. she must. She probably becomes an '80s porn star, which uh, should be exciting because, yeah, in, in, in the time frame and the cr- chronology of these, like X takes place when these porns, like, I don't think they, I can't remember if they specifically name. I think they name drop fucking Deep Throat or something. Because Wayne has a line when they're like buying snacks at the convenience store or whatever. He's like, if I if our movie makes even half of what Deep Throat made, then we'll be fucking set for a long time or something along those lines. So, uh, yeah, this is when porn was like in theaters, basically, and you could go to like a porn theater, and those were specifically designated as places that only adults go, and they show. I mean, there was probably grind houses and stuff that played porn and, you know, Kung Fu flicks or like a Fulci flick or whatever the fuck. But <laughs> largely porn theaters were like their own, like, looked down upon, but still like their own kind of, you know, little cottage industry. And yeah, the, the, the towards the late 70s, I think, is when these things were really blowing up. 
But I always love f- old footage of old New York where, like, on, like, 52nd Street where it's just fucking rows and rows of fucking theaters. And, like, most of them are skeezy grindhouse-looking things. And a lot of them are fucking just straight up, like, triple X porn theaters. And there usually it would be like a sex shop not too far away and like a liquor store with a bunch of bums fucking hanging out in front. And it's just scuzzy and like such like a such a vibe that like I don't really want to experience personally. Like if I had a time machine, I wouldn't go back to that fucking because you're going to get like it's, it's dangerous. Like it's fucking just the Wild West. Jason and might come there... and kill you and then turn into a melty dinosaur face. Uh, yes, there there is that, although I wouldn't try boxing him because it doesn't work out very well. Uh, but yeah, like it, it's kind of a tangential relation to that in X. Like it's, it's kind of goes along with the same the same vibe. Ty West talks about it in the special features a little bit like the, the entrepreneurial uh, spirit of the, the porn directors and like you know it was like a brand new thing and they were all they all had the dollar signs in their eyes and wanted to make the next you know debbie does dallas or deep throat or other movies that like weirdly i haven't seen like maybe, maybe that's that should be the the follow-up when doing the nasty ends and we run out of the nasty movies we should just watch a bunch of porn movies <laughs> deep throat, talk, debbie talk does dallas behind the green door those sorts of things those are about the only three that I can name offhand. I'm sure there's plenty of others. Like, I, I bet somewhere there's a, a box office list. I'm sure my phone is listening to me, so this should be pretty easy to look up at Google. <laughs> Top grossing porn movies. I don't know, because the porn theaters, it's kind of a died out thing. Like, everybody watches porn on their phone or on their computer at home and have for the last 20 years or so. Well, and that's what... uh Wayne was talking about with making the movies and saying the VHS market is going to change things. Uh, people are going to be able to watch what they want in the privacy of their own home. Oh, does he? Cause that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty ahead of its time for 79. Like that is really when I don't think VCR is really like super caught on until, well, I guess like, yeah, 80, 81. I feel like in the mid eighties, people were still borrowing VCRs from the library and shit or renting them from the rental stores. Yeah. And buying a copy of like fucking whatever Rambo or something of VHS costs like 90 fucking dollars. For my photo doctoring purposes, I'm in a few like vintage advertisement topics followed on Twitter and on Facebook and shit. And you'd see old ads like, VCR cost in 1980. They were fucking expensive. They were like five, six hundred fucking dollars. It was like buying a PS5 back then. Fifteen hundred dollars. Holy fucking shit. One thousand to fourteen hundred dollars in 1980. So it's definitely, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's still, that's still the same thing with technology when it's brand fucking new it's gonna be like patrick bateman can afford it but just about nobody fucking else can kind of deal uh so but then that i've heard it explained that that's a reason why like for so many years like buying a fucking copy of well well it's it's two things they couldn't fucking manufacture these things like fast enough. It's kind of like what vinyl was doing for like a couple years there where like they couldn't fucking, there were only so many factories that were making VHS tapes at the time. And like people were fucking gobbling that shit up. And like, uh, the other thing is video stores, like video stores were, you know, the main buyers of these things and people would go fucking rent them obviously because nobody wants to pay $90 for a fucking movie. They may have not seen already. Uh, but like that would also be, you know, if you're buying it from the video store, you're not paying for what they paid for the video. You're paying for what they're going to take a loss on not renting that video out 5 billion times at like a dollar a piece or whatever. Like that, that, that tape is easily worth fucking, you know, 90 fucking rentals. And at that point it's going to be falling apart, especially if it's like fast times at Ridgemont high and people have fast forwarded that one scene or rewound that one scene about 500 times. 90 <laughs> viewings is like, 
pretty optimistic, but I don't know if if you've run VHS tapes on clean players, they it's not so much like the physically like because VHS tape, the actual tape that's inside the fucking thing is pretty stout. The problem is it degrades over time. So that's what part of why I backed off big time on uh, collecting VHS shit is because it's going to fall the fuck apart like soon within our lifetime. All I think all of it's going to be pretty much fucking garbage. So uh, not really a good investment nowadays in like the collector's market, but there are people who are paying insane amounts of money for shit uh, for some fucking reason. Um, anyway, but yeah, I've, I, I, I don't know. This, this shit kind of fascinates me. Like the, the early days of home, home video and what, like what a wild west shit show it was kind of, especially in the fucking UK. Like this, like freak people out and you know i'm sure it, it the, these things come in waves like it's the, the new exciting thing that all the kids are into so like eventually somebody's gonna find a problem with it and with the right media manipulation though they will make it everyone's fucking problem and start litigating the shit which is insane that's an interesting thing to think about the the videos and nasties too is that like a lot of these these people fucking like mary whitehouse especially never watched any of these movies like they they hired other people to watch them and then like you know at best got their opinion on you know and this is a great dramatization of a movie called censor for anybody out there that hasn't seen that movie it's kind of a fictionalized version of one of the UK video nasty, like the, the BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification, which was like an actual government, you know, government paid for basically committee to rate and classify films. And they they were the deciders if your movie could be fucking released in all of the all of the UK. So which is kind of fucking insane and uh a lot a lot of movies got the fucking axe or they they got the hedge trimmer and got chopped to fucking shit and released in crappy versions like and this is this is all obviously like a few like just barely a few years before i was born is kind of the mind-blowing shit but like i mean the, the the repercussions of a lot of this you know this talk basically you know, bled over into the nineties as well. You know, the, the first time I saw a whole lot of, you know, what have been gone on to be my favorite movies were in heavily edited versions on TV. And it's, it's, it's all about, you know, protecting the children from this, you know, material that supposedly, although is not backed up by science whatsoever, will harm them. I don't, I don't know. Por porn is a little bit different. Like I but I mean, really, is it like what? What's worse? Like, what do you want your kid to see less? Like, two people fucking or two people killing each other? You could make the argument that like children shouldn't be exposed to either of these things until they're either a certain age or a certain. And I was I forget what we were talking about. So somebody was talking about like age is like you know age is a weird like way for people to like on a national level quantify what they actually mean as maturity basically so like it's 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 it's, it's different between different countries as far as like the, the the rating system goes obviously in the states here like you know the r rating for most theatrical movies is like where they will actually like even give a shit how old somebody is that's going to a movie and it's 17 is the age which i i don't really know the story on why they settled on that because obviously like 18 is the age to do a lot of things in this country that's when you're technically considered an, an, an you know your own adult um but like pornography is 21 in most places i don't know there's i think that's changed recently too and i think that's maybe more to fit like basically all international standards because people from all around the country are like you know for example accessing stuff like Pornhub. so i think 21 is like 
probably the maximum age in most places. I don't know. I, I've never really. I should, I should have looked some of this up beforehand. And it's uh, <laughs> sounded like a little bit more of uh, an authority on these things. I know another great movie on the subject is uh, this film is not yet rated. I think it's called. Oh, Which this is, film was yeah, not movie. yet rated. Yeah, this film is not yet rated. Yeah, yeah, where the guys try and get a movie rated by the MPAA, and there's yeah, just a lot of little, like undercover kind of work about how the rating system in the states works. And it's super fucking shady, and uh, it's a good documentary. Can, it's a really good documentary, and it, like it kind of exposes like how shady it also is in the states. I there I don't think there's nothing wrong with warning your audience about what's going to be in your movie or like if you're a parent wanting to know what's in the movies or music or video games or what the fuck ever that your kids are going to be consuming that's that's responsible parenting you should know these fucking things but um yeah, I I kind of chalk a lot of, like I don't, I don't foresee the haze code is what it's called in the in the states was the I have to look up when that was when that was the thing that, that was basically that was a long running like uh, list of rules basically that your uh, your film could have uh, so this is what Google says the Hayes Code was a self imposed industry set of guidelines for all the motion motion pictures that were released between 1934 and 1968. The code prohibited profanity, suggestive nudity, graphic or realistic violence, sex, sexual persuasions, and rape. Uh, there, there was a little, little bit more to that. But uh, 1934, so that's like, so I think well into the, the, the talky era of cinema for sure. But the Hayes Code, is my understanding, is kind of a gathering up of like, up until like 1934 there aren't really any like humongous fucking movie studios i don't think like you know cinema is still kind of a relatively new thing in the tw in the 20s and so kind of in like uh there's another great documentary that now i can't think of the, what the name of is but it's about nudity in film and uh yeah this uh, different states basically prior to the Hayes code had different rules about what could be in a movie and what couldn't be in a movie and largely that was in response to like stag films and porn much like what fucking howard not howard what's you know, his name johnny the projectionist from pearl is shown oh, off and he's all I can't remember his all name stoked. so yeah. that's like yeah so pearls the pearls is a good decade before the Hayes code but like he's already he's talking about how it, he he foresees it'll become a legal thing that like you know he could go off and become a rich pornographer basically MGM Studios heyday was the 30s or 40s i think so okay so they they were probably about it like the Hayes code was kind of a convenience thing for them because like when you would have your movie travel around the country basically quite literally it wasn't like nowadays where like your shit just gets satellite beamed into fucking theaters when you had to literally ship your, your film around the country to get it to play in little nickelodeons or you know fucking traveling roadshow theater type shit uh you would have to cut you'd have to have different cuts for different states depending on depending on the movie especially like if, if it had like a lot of you know even if it wasn't like you know specifically a porn movie if it had like you know different innuendos there 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 was some fucking haze code shit about inter interracial relationships also which i don't really know like people were pretty compliant with the haze code like there's lots of great movies uh prior to this or like the early days of the haze code that like really toe the line in regards to what was allowed in movies but for the most part like uh porn went pretty well underground until like the 70s when this you know shit was repealed in the late 60s basically but uh yeah the haze code sucks it's fucking racist it's sexist it's anti-artist it's anti-freedom of speech so you know you you can be you could be a responsible person and a responsible parent and not like things, but like you shouldn't 
be mandating what I, you know, or anybody else can or can't watch or can't consume within <laughs> there there's obviously a few a few exceptions which i'm not gonna mention because if there's like an itunes algorithm i don't want to fuck with you but Could, you consenting uh, adults is is key yes yes exactly if no if nobody got hurt in the entertainment that i'm watching then there's no fucking problem and even then, like I said, I watch all kinds of fucking stupid cannibal movies for the video nasty show where poor animals lost their lives, and that's a okay. And in fact, the whole Mondo phase of the fucking cinema where people were obsessed with like cannibal movies and Mondo movies and shit like Faces of Death. I have a Faces of Death box set sitting on my uh, my my shelf over there that feels like the tape from the ring. Like it just feels fuck cursed as fuck, <laughs> but like. I also own it and I'm a glutton for punishment and I feel like it's like my civic duty to watch these things and report on them so that they're not forgotten, but also people don't have to experience them for, for themselves. I, I'll do it for you, but uh, I haven't gotten to that point yet because I'm afraid. Don't be afraid to watch X or Pearl if you like X. We could talk about this for another two hours. But I think, I think you were I think right. I'm about spent. <laughs> that was the money shot, everybody. Thank you, yep. Mark. Thanks for talking about these with me, and thanks for yeah, having absolutely, a man. Conversation about morality and horror and censorship and art and all sorts of fucking shit. Do you want to plug your your um, your band camp since that's your yeah, other I'll, main thing right now? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll pimp my wares. Yeah, go 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 listen to my music. It's on it's on Bandcamp is where you can buy an album and like I you know, that's that's about my best shot of making any actual money, which is super cool. You should definitely buy, you know, at least if you're not buying physical shit, you should be buying the cheap downloads from bands and artists that you like. My my two albums I think are like two and three dollars a piece and uh it means a lot to me when people buy them, but if not, my shit is also on Spotify and uh, and basically every other music streaming app, including ones that I've never even fucking heard of. Hopefully they're not like run by like, like is Donald Trump got like a streaming, streaming music app out yet? <laughs> oh, it's all full Truth of Kid music. Rock and Ted Nugent. I should maybe look into this. I should go ask Distro Kid. I'm like, uh, none of these are like right wing stations that you're sending my shit to because I don't, I don't want to profit off that. But uh, yeah, if, if you got the Spotify's, look me up. I'm, I'm Fancy Mark on there. I, I make weird electronic experimental kind of music. Uh, I'm working on working on a new album right now. I just put one out at the end of December that's called Black Cat Under a Blood Moon, which is the most awkward to say fucking title of an album and i'm kind of regretting it the other one's jinxed which is named after my cat which is pretty easy uh but yeah if you like um, horror movie soundtracks or like industrial shit or um just weird like synth punk kind of sound and shit uh check me out and uh, follow me there and that would be super dope uh also yeah we, we're uh, running towards the end of the doing the nasty season two over on the Teapots Collective. Uh, if you look up uh, it's the podcast under the stairs uh, side feed, where there you can find doing the nasty and a couple other awesome shows like Chronicle and uh, Opera Omnia. Uh, yeah, doing the nasty season two is a look at the tier three video nasty list, which is the lowest of the three tiers. So supposedly the tamest of the because there's 72 movies on the first two lists, I believe. And I think there's like 84 or something on our list for tier three. Uh, we, we found it to be not the case that like some of these movies should have probably been on the higher tier tier list. But it's kind of all over the place. It's a, it's a fucking huge crapshoot of all these weird fucking goofy movies. Uh, a lot of which are awful, like just terrible fucking garbage that, uh, you couldn't pay me to rewatch, but since it's Duncan, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll <laughs> take the bullet. I'll watch fucking the love butcher mosquito, the rapist or fucking don't, don't answer the phone was one that we watched pretty recently where I was like, I will never watch this goddamn movie again. But, uh, yeah, that's the, the doing the nasty over on the teapots 
I guess that's, that's about all. That's about all my wares. I'll I'll try not to go ten months again before I pop back on this show. We we had some other ideas for some other stuff that I think we will get to another day, hopefully here pretty soon. But uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me. I had a blast over here. Yeah, man. Uh, always, you're always welcome. And it won't be ten months if I have anything to do about it. But until then, thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Drink the bottled water. Don't listen to Republican governors when they tell you pretty much anything unless you've (laughs) had that verified by independent scientists. That's a very clunky way to remind you all that there used to be a thing called duck and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Duck.